Thank you very much, uh, Ali, for the invitation. Should I uh, should I get it started at this point? Yeah, what I'll do is um, we'll we'll probably give people about a, uh, another uh, fifteen or twenty seconds, and I'll just introduce you quickly, and uh, I definitely can get started here. Let's Okay, great. So uh, as people roll in, I uh, wanted to go ahead and uh, welcome everyone to another session of uh, Virtual Global Spine Conference. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everyone here again on uh, behalf of myself and uh, our uh, co-hosts and, and panelists uh, who are with us today. And uh, today we have the honor of uh, having uh, uh, Dr. John Cummins, a uh, neurosurgeon from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital joining us. Of course, not only is he the partner of one of our uh, uh, good friends and co-host, Dr. John Shen, uh, but he's also a, a very uh, passionate educator, a, a neurosurgeon with expertise in both cranial and spine surgery, and uh, he will be our guest today. He has, uh, he has a special interest, uh, as we said, in, in education and training, and uh, I believe uh, some of our discussions um, some of our polls, some of our discussions uh, on social media, both by myself and by uh, our fellow co-hosts here, apparently got his attention. So he wanted to uh, share some thoughts and uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, the topic of uh, uh, variability in spine surgery. So uh, Dr. Cummins, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Ali and the other co-hosts, uh, John, everybody. Thank you so much for hosting me. I uh, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so the the idea I uh, you know I sent a, a message to, uh, to to Ali to just to thank him for his polls. I think they're very thought provoking, and um, it it just highlights uh, how much incredible variability there is in what we do. And uh, you know, I, I look at all these polls, and they're a lot of fun. It's fun to see how people do things, and you get an instant snapshot. Although, of course, as, as you pointed out, Ali, we don't know who's really answering these things. So, uh, it, it could be your kid, it could be, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's nonetheless, it's really cool to see where there's consensus and other areas where people are completely split. And uh, I just selected a handful of them, and I just wanted to go over some of the, uh, these polls tonight and show some articles and. Uh, really highlight the areas where we still don't know what we're doing. Uh, uh, I uh, looked for fun at some guidelines in other specialties. And for example, I looked at cervical stenosis uh, management guidelines, and uh, I picked another stenosis, aortic stenosis. And that's when you really realize how far behind we are uh, to cardiology. Uh, you know, they had William Harvey in the 1620s. Uh, we have Harvey, uh, Cushing, 1900s. And the... Um, the aortic stenosis uh, recommendations are all class one. I mean, it's incredibly detailed. It's incredibly solid data. Uh, they really know what they're doing uh, when they're dealing with like valvular disease in the heart. And uh, so I think there's so much work to be done. So I'll, I'll go over some uh, some polls. Some I think were, were really uh, fun and interesting, you know, uh, very stylistic. Uh, for example, do you give uh, patients your cell phone? Uh, do, you, do you do that routinely? Do you never do that? almost never, and, uh, and sometimes, and I, I, I myself was in the sometimes category, and it gets a little bit at, I like this because it gets at how do patients get a hold of us in, in this state. It used to be simple, um, but now they have the office, they have social media, they have email, uh, they have messaging through, uh, well, through, through either uh, through our cell phone, but also messaging through uh, our electronic record. And so there's so many streams that we have to keep track of. And, and so there is something appealing about maybe just saying, look, just call me. This is my number. This is, this is the only thing I, I check. Um, some of us still carry a pager. We're required to do this at work. It goes off about once a month, um, but it's just one, one other of the many streams. Uh, come to find out, I looked this up and there are people who have, who have looked at this and, and who have written articles on this. And there's one uh, article uh, that basically says if you give 207 uh, orthopedic patients um, your phone number, 21 of them end up calling, and 55% of the calls are good and appropriate uh, for, for urgent matters, and the other 45% uh, could have probably been handled by an office phone call. 
uh, for example, appropriate was acute post-op issues. My wound is draining. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do right now. Not appropriate were, you know, when's my next appointment? Uh, could you tell me about, you know, uh, the results of my latest uh, uh, x-ray? Um, but I think it's, it's food for thought and it's something as, as, as medical practice continues to evolve, I, I think that that'll come, become more and more uh, relevant. Uh, here, here's another... So, uh, uh, Sorry, John, uh, do you mind going back to, yeah, thank you. So I apologize, I, I didn't tell, what I didn't tell you is that our guests, we usually put them on the hot seat and ask him questions. So, yes. so, we're gonna, so I'm going yes, to throw please. this back at you. I'm going to throw this back at you. How, how, do you. how do you handle this? If a patient says, you know, Dr. Kuhlman, can I have your cell phone number in case I have a question? It's hard to get through your office, all of that. What do you do? Sure. So I tell them it's best to text me because I may be in the OR, I may be with another patient, and I will not um, generally interrupt what I'm doing to answer a phone call. But if I see a text message, I'll reply it at my earliest convenience. And I don't personally consider a text message to be that different than a message through uh, electronic record or through email. So I don't mind getting a text message. And I tell them I'll answer it, you know, uh, when I can. But it, uh, if it's urgent, uh, you need, you know, uh, you need to call the the page operator for, for the on-call uh, neurosurgeon. That's that's really interesting. I'm gonna ask Matt Goodwin and Alex what they do, but I, I, I absolutely love your answer because that's exactly what I tell my patients not to do. And it just highlights the variability. So, I, so I, there are occasional cases in which I give patients my cell phone number, but I tell them, I say the only thing I don't do is I don't text with patients. I'm happy. I'll call you back if I miss it, or I'll try to answer. But oh. I don't prefer to text patients. Oh. So it's funny how right off the back there's already a big difference. <laughs> so Matt in in St. Louis, what what do you and your partner do? Uh, that, first of all, what a great start of this talk. This is I love this. So um, I almost all my patients have my cell number, um, and I tell them very much a similar thing, uh, which is um, you can call, but I'm probably not very useful because I could be in clinic or in the OR. Um, and I typically say, but if you, if you text me, I'll get it at least by the end of the day. And I always tell them, you know, what I don't want is you have a draining wound and, and you go four days or you go to some urgent care and I don't hear about it. Um, and I say, you know, really my office and my nurse are, are going to be a lot more useful, but, you know, feel free to text it. And really no one's really abused that. I, I shouldn't say no one. Rarely is that abused. I think I had one patient call me at three in the morning. He's a little confused, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, but, uh, yeah, so very much I say, text me. And a lot of times I end up just screenshotting and sending it to my nurse anyway, and they know that, and it, it ends up not being a big deal. There you go. Uh, Alex, what's, uh, I'm, I'm interested I, in what you do, but yeah, also I, what's, what, what's acceptable in Europe? Uh, and I know there's a lot of variation like there is here in the U S, but what would you say, what, what do you do and what do most surgeons do? Yeah, I just wanted to, to point out that I have got two female attendings, and um, this is a critical point. And some, sometimes the approach of, um, of some, some patients are very inappropriate. And I, I just uh, recommend not to give the cell phone number and just to have a, uh, some kind of distance. This is not a distance to, um, to harm anybody. We have a good administration. The administration has got a telephone number and they love to, um, to moderate between the patient and, and the surgeon. And there were uh, several incidents with, um, it's a gender question as well. Uh, for me, it's very easy to uh, stop any conversation, but not everybody can. And um, that a surgeon, a female surgeon feels bad about um, texting or calls. Uh, so my team, um, uh, must not give any cell phone number. I see. So you made it a policy where you're just not giving cell phone numbers so it doesn't become an issue for anybody. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Well, sorry to stop you there, uh, John, but uh, please proceed. You just want to see what everybody thought. Well, I think it's also a good point that you uh, bring up is that uh, to have a policy across the department so that you don't have certain faculty giving it, other faculty, you know, I'm going to go to such and such, you know, he gives out a cell phone number. So that's also an interesting thing to, to make it uniform so that uh, there are no favorites. So uh, here is another um, interesting stylistic question. How do you, what practice style maybe, and not just regarding communication and cell phone, but, but how long do you follow patients? So this was an interesting poll. Uh, how long do you follow patients for non-deformity uh, spine fusion patients? And, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the group that was greater than two years 
but it's not that I necessarily make an appointment at exactly, you know, one year out, exactly two years out. It's more that I leave an open door type philosophy. And I think the, the issue is so many patients come back uh, with another problem and I don't want them to have to jump through hoops to get to me, especially if I've operated on them two years ago. You know, I did it. And, and oftentimes, you, you know, we've all seen this, you know, hey, I had an L4, L5 disc and I, I have a recurrence in sciatica and now it's in my other leg. And it's a little bit uh, someone, I think it was David uh, Polly who had made the analogy to dentistry or said, you know, it's almost like you're a dentist, you know, and then they're, they're going to come in, they're going to have another tooth problem. And you have to just say, you know, these are patients you're going to, you're going to have for life um, a little bit like a, a dental practice where one problem can occur after another. And I thought that was an interesting analogy. So I'd be curious to, to hear if anybody else uh, has any other thoughts on that, but that's a little bit more of a, when you, when you say, okay, we're done, um, you know, you need a re-referral to see me or, uh, you know, call me if there's a problem down the road. Yeah, I thought that was, uh, you know, it, it's funny things that we take for granted and we're like, yeah, sure, this is how we do it. But I think really that's the whole point of this is there are just so many different ways of doing it. And I've had partners who say, well, I, I follow patients for at least two years because journals want, you know, want two-year follow-up. I mean, that's not really a great reason, but it's a practical reason. Um, um, I'm interested to see what other, uh, others think. I know Nader and Michael uh, Galgano uh, jumped in. Jonathan is there. Jonathan, Nader, or Michael, what do you guys think? How, how long do you, uh, is, is this in line with what you do, say, for, um, you know, for fusion surgery, one-year follow-up? Yeah, I, I usually follow people for about a year or so. And then at that point, um, I really just tell them, look, I, I don't think you need to really see me anymore. You're doing fantastic. If they are, if you have any issues, uh, just give a call back. I mean, the last thing I want is for them to, to feel that I've kind of cut them loose. And if they have an issue, they want to go find another surgeon. So I think we have to all avoid that situation. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and honestly, I think everyone would agree with me that you know, listen, I mean, if our patients, even if you discharge them or say, okay, great, everything looks good. If, if something happens later, they're going to find you, they're going to call you, they're going to come and see you again. So as I think everybody would agree that we really follow our patients almost for life. I mean, you know, uh, people email you, they find out where you are, even if you've moved. So um, that, that was the point of that question. Yeah, I agree. So another uh, poll that caught my eye that I thought was maybe a little bit more stylistic, but I thought highlighted a, a sea change that's occurred uh, since my own residency when uh, we were told you do the decompression first because you have to see the anatomy and then you put in your hardware because you want to know where you're putting in the screws. Um, and of course, you had to be very careful. You didn't want to drop a lateral mass uh, screw that was poorly loaded onto the back of the cord or something like that. But I think uh, now we're seeing uh, a majority of respondents in a poll like this, do you do the laminectomy first or do you place the hardware first? Say, well, I'll place the screws first, then I'll do my laminectomy. And that's actually the way I, I do it too. And I'm not 100% sure, sure why I do it like that. I suppose one thing is that there's a, there's a certain amount of, of security in knowing that the dorsal elements are, are still there. So as you pass things from uh, to, your, to your resident or back and forth, as you, you, you feel as if you're putting the hardware that the parts of the spine that require the most uh, application of force is being done with the protection still in place. Um, I suppose that's the, that's the rationale for putting in the hardware first. Uh, but, but I'm the first one to admit that, especially uh, pre-navigation uh, for, for pedicle screws, uh, we always did the laminectomy first. We could palpate the medial pedicle screw wall. And I think this is something that we're probably not gonna see uh, a study on, I'm, I'm not sure anybody's gonna to wanna to publish uh, about their, their catastrophe uh, uh, over an exposed uh, spinal cord. So, um, so I think it's likely to remain more of a stylistic uh, point of view, but, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, uh, over the course of my practice, something that I've, I've seen change over the years. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, that same thing, you know, on the chat box here, uh, John, you may not be, you may not have privy to the chat box, but. Okay, Again, just yeah. very interesting uh, responses in terms of the variability. And I think I already I saw a couple of responses, much like my own. I trained, I guess, like you, or, you know, you do the laminectomy decompression, then you instrument. And now I'm 180, you know, completely opposite. Instrument first, 
I mean, of course, we all know we all know in, in, in the setting of deformity, you know, you, you don't you may instrument, but you don't put the rods, so you can do the corrections and then you put the rods. But um, it's you know great answers again, just so much variability with with this in particular. But it looks like a lot of folks are really instrumenting first, just like the poll indicates. Yeah. So the other thing where I think this one, there's certainly more consensus than the, the majority of the other polls that you posed, but this was one where, what would you do for uh, an L4, L5 grade one spondy? And this is where also uh, through the course of my professional career, I've seen a, a, a change in that. Um, I'm in the camp where I'll still do posterior lateral uh, fusions with pedicle screws. Um, seem to have a good results with that, unless of course there is such a collapse of the disc space that it's gonna be impossible to restore pyramidal height. Um, but there's a clear trend towards uh, towards uh, open or MIS uh, T lift and away from, from uh, other techniques, uh, I think compared to, to the late 90s, early 2000s. And, and much more consensus. I see Dr. Dottole here. Nader, uh, welcome. And uh, uh, what, what, do you, what, what do you think about this? You know, the reason we asked that question is, well, you know how social media is, right? There's a million reasons why you post things, but the, but the particular reason I, I, I ask this is, so a lot of us in some of these meetings and conferences, we always talk about lateral, front, back, and, and I, I obviously, a lot of people here know, I, I love the MIST lift, the one level MIST lift for four five. Um, and there's a lot of hype about lateral, which is valid, you know, a lot of us still do some lateral, but the reality is, um, most people are still doing the posterior approach or post, almost posterior only approach. So I just, I always like to gauge the, the climate and what people think. So what do you think about that matter in, in your group, your practice and what, what, what you've been uh, doing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, these polls are fantastic, but pertaining to that specific question, uh, symptomatic grade one spondy, my, my go-to procedure is actually a T-lift, open or MIS, depending on the anatomy, but, but my go-to procedure is T-lift. And, uh, you know, we try to maximize a lumbar lordosis, remove both facets, put the cage in the front and compress posteriorly. Uh, the advantage is my first and foremost for me, I would do that because I'm, I'm good at it compared to other techniques. Number two is I would achieve neural decompression that's direct. Uh, number three is there's an opportunity of also posterior lateral fusion as well, in, in addition to interbody fusion, especially with open and many open techniques. And uh, you know the you know with the A lifts it's not without complications, right? Like you have vascular complications, you have sometimes delayed discharge because of ileus. With the lateral approaches, you know sometimes you have a minor deficit, be it a, a numbness. Uh, uh, you know, or femoral neuropathy. I mean, they're rare, especially if you're good at it, but they're not zero. And I really, you know, I'm not sure if, even if you counsel the patients, they're super ready for, to accept a deficit with, with those sometimes lateral approaches. So that's why it's, you know, as we always know, it's like the workhorse of uh, lumbar fusions is the TLIF approach. Um, so for those reasons, you know, I mean, that's, that's my take on it. Uh, and same thing, my colleagues, you know, if, if, if someone ne needs a f f fusion for a spondy, the, the TLIF approach is the most favorable approach uh, uh, to them as well. And I have the sense that a lot of people develop expertise in one particular technique and really try to apply it, uh, you know, you get good at one thing and, and you can do it uh, safely and that becomes your go-to procedure um, as long as the goals of the operation are achieved. I think you sometimes choosing the approach, uh, you choose which complications you're willing to put up with. Um, so very grateful. Yeah, absolutely. So, late, lately, we're seeing articles uh, uh, like this in New England Journal of Medicine uh, came out in August of, of this year. Um, we presented a journal club and, and now we're seeing this, which, which surprised me because, um, you know, uh, in this article, decompression versus decompression plus fusion in grade one spondylolisthesis and stenosis, um, there was no advantage to adding a fusion. Uh, I, I don't know that this will stand the test of time because I think that there will be patients uh, that, you know, and this disagrees a little bit with previously published work. And I think there will be patients uh, who go on to slip. And the question will be, how can we early on identify those that are destined uh, to slip? 
Um, but just to add a little bit more provocation in, in the discussion, um, you know, under what circumstances would we not even fuse in a grade one listesis at L4, L5 with stenosis? And I, I think add the one note. The, the interesting thing is one of the co-authors from this New England Journal um, um, paper, uh, excellent work, he answered to Ali Baj um, Twitter post and with the question, who needs fusion? What, um, and this was interesting because this study was published after his post and obviously he knew the results of this. And it's so funny because with on Twitter, you can really reach a lot of, of guys with yes. knowledge, unpublished knowledge, and it's really good. I'm interested, Ali, please ask this question annually every year. I, I wonder how the bars will change by time. Yeah, no, I, I love Clemens and I really like his comments and he's, he's very engaging. Um, you know, I, I think there, you know, you, the data is data and I think it's important. Um, but I think like Dr. Kuhlman is saying, I don't know if this is going to stand the test of time. I think the, the, the patient population and the pathology is too variable to lump it all together as a degen spondy. Uh, you know, not every degen spondy is, is the same. What's going on above? What's going on below? Is there deformity, scoliosis? Uh, uh, but no, I, I love Dr. Weber, and, and I think he's very engaging online. Yeah. I think the holy grail is going to be to discern uh, patients to, uh, as you pointed out, you, you, using the word lump, I mean, uh, how do you tease apart? Uh, it, it's, it's really much more subtle than just a spondy. I mean, you've got a, a spondy with a tall disc, and as the disc wears out, it's going to keep slipping, and you've got a spondy that's run its course, that's bone on bone, that's if effectively already fused. Those are completely two different entities. What are the facets doing? What is the angle of the facet? How much facet fluid is there? I have a case like that a little bit later on to show. Um, what about drains? Something that really surprised me, 50-50 on an ACDF, one or two levels with drain. And so that uh, I, I agree with Ali's comment uh, that, you know, I was surprised by the results because I can't remember the last time I used a drain in an ACDF. If, if there's ever going to be a procedure that we skip a drain, for, for me personally, I mean, I use drains routinely in the posterior spine, but the ACDF is such a dry procedure and uh, that um, I, just, I just don't use a drain for an ACDF. Uh, I was surprised to see that 50% of respondents do. And then the question comes up, do they even prevent hematoma? And I'll just show you the real quick study here that um, in the posterior cervical spine, it doesn't seem to prevent hematoma. Uh, in, a, in a review, uh, this was a couple of years ago uh, at the spine section, but uh, 1,800 cases, posterior cervical, and uh, there were 11 hematomas, and uh, there was no difference between drain versus no drain. Uh, even infections were not different, with one exception, when they looked at specifically diabetic patients, drains reduced the infection rate. So, so drains may not even prevent a hematoma, which is interesting, I, you know, fascinating, but. Yeah, John, that's, that's a, that one was probably one of the most surprising uh, poll results. And I wonder, you know, I, I kind of keep an eye and I think I usually know the background or the training background of the of the folks who answer who write comments, but I wonder if it's a training thing um, uh, or 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 a geographical thing. Maybe more folks, you know, in Europe maybe do it, or is it an ortho neuro thing? Um, I, I have a feeling it may be that. Uh, I don't know. Matt or Alex says, uh, and Mike Selby, uh, you guys have. Uh, the ortho ortho crew here is, is it a is it part of ortho training that you guys leave a lot of drains in, in ACDS because it's definitely not a significant part of neuro training. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I put it. It's funny. I put a drain in in mine. Uh, I can't remember the last time it really was really doing much though. Right? They all come out day one, and that's kind of the end of it. So um, I don't know if that's from practice or what, but it, it certainly might be a training thing. Uh, even though I think even in the arthroplasty literature, a lot of that's changed as well recently. Hmm. You know, I, I will ask this to, to the group though. I, I don't know how many here do uh, outpatient ACDFs. Um, I think part of me not leaving and never really have left drains, say for your standard one or two levels is they're getting in overnight, they're going home the next morning. So somehow I'm kind of comforted by the fact that they're being observed overnight. 
I do know that colleagues who do a lot of outpatient ACDFs, they'll leave a drain, they'll take it out two or three hours later in the in the PACU if it's not you know draining above a certain number, and then they send patients home. So I wonder if the transition to a completely ambulatory ACDF impacts that or not. I, I don't know the answer to that because I don't do ambulatory ACDF, but I wonder if that that has a role. It's a good point. Yeah. And I think also the other thing is there's probably just very, very little harm uh, to a drain in the anterior cervical region. It's a little tricky because it can, you know, you have to create a separate hole in a cosmetically important area uh, and it limits the caliber of the drain you can use. But the only downside, I suppose, if you suture it in, well, it's just one more step, one more thing to do uh, to remove it uh, the next morning. But uh, that, may, that may be why uh, there's a tendency to leave drains. I think one would probably rather err on the side of leaving one than not leaving one. And that may be why there's so little cost to leaving it. So here's another one uh, that, that was interesting. I try to scratch a little bit below the surface on that. And uh, the question is, what do we do for antibiotics? We all know that uh, supposedly the only dose that really matters is the one that's flowing in the patient's veins at the time that we do their skin incision, and including the redose uh, intraoperatively. But uh, most of us, uh, well, many of us, according to the poll, and I count myself in that group, do it for 24 hours. And so I thought, uh, where does that come from? Uh, and come to find out other surgical subspecialties are not so clear cut about the single pre-op dose. Uh, if you look at cardiac surgery recommendations, uh, there's a study right now looking at 24 versus 48 hours to prevent sternal wound infections, presumably 48 hours, because that's how long it takes for the superficial most layer of the skin to become epithelialized. Uh, so in our literature, uh, there are a systemic, um, you know, system, excuse me, systemic, systematic reviews of the literature that tell us that there's very little evidence that post-operative antibiotics uh, do anything. Uh, yet we, we, we tend to do it for 24 hours and I suppose there's, there's probably not a whole lot of risk to 24 hours. And the, the quality of the evidence is considered moderate in this meta-analysis. By the way, this was an interesting review article because not only did it look at uh, prophylactic uh, antibiotics, but it looked at all the other prophylactic measures we do postoperatively, such as uh, reinitiating nutrition uh, and so on, and looking at what can make an impact on our post-op infections. So personally, for me, it's 24 hours. That's what uh, we tend to do. Um, I, I, I know that there are colleagues who send patients home with a five-day course of oral antibiotics, and there's really uh, no data to support doing that. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's also an another one of those things where uh, I thought it was just so much variability in that. Nader, I wanted to ask you what uh, you guys at your center, do you do both simple, straightforward stuff and very complex revisions? Does your choice of post-operative antibiotics, does it depend on whether there's instrumentation or not and or whether there's drains or not? Or do you have a policy, you know, hey, it's only the intra-op dose and that's it. How, what do you guys do at Northwestern? Yeah, it's pretty standardized for everybody. So 24 hours, uh, regardless whether there's a drain or not. So just 24 hours, everybody follows this policy. Now the major, conf like, and we found that there's no change in terms of incidence of wound infections, whether you keep the antibiotics until the drains come out, which was the previous practice, compared to what we do right now, which we've implemented about maybe three years ago. So 24 hours and that's it. Uh, regardless, if you leave a drain for seven days, it's just 24 hours. And I think, um, you know, the main, I mean, the, the major confounder here is, you know, we, we uh, leave a vancomycin powder uh, and uh, following like during, or at the end of each open case, uh, whether it's an open T lift single level or a T4 to the pelvis, we use vanc powder and leave drains. So, um, so the vanc powder concentration in the wound is, is maybe uh, you know ten times, hundred times more than you know in, in, in intravenously. So um, so that that definitely uh, probably helps too with with prevention of wound infections mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. This also tells us that. Uh, well, there's still a little bit of room to go on the quality of the data on that. I mean, the cardiac surgeons are struggling with uh, some of you in proposed 72 hours. So I think it, it's not something that's fully answered yet uh, for post-op uh, infection. So 
this one, most people tended to want to operate on a major neurologic deficit early. We, you know, we didn't talk about cauticoina. This is foot drop and presumably other neurologic losses, um, like other nerve roots. But um, what would you do for a new onset disc herniation with a new foot drop? And I suppose foot drop is a bit heterogeneous. You know, sometimes you'll get a call, there's a foot drop and it's really a four plus out of five. Other times you get a call to a foot drop and it's a two out of five. And I think those are different entities. Um, Personally, I tend to do them early, especially if the patient is distressed by the symptoms and um, you know is, is really in favor of proceeding. I mean, I think uh, for those of us who have been on the other side of the table and have had surgery, I think uh, to feel like you're, the surgeon's on your side is sort of advocating for you doing everything the surgeon can to help you out is a good feeling, is a feeling that, okay, this guy's looking out for me. And um, I, I think, my perception also is that the more severe the deficit, the more likely there's going to be a, a residual deficit when all is said and done, whether you've chosen to operate early or late. You know, if somebody has a very bad foot drop, chances are even an early surgery may not completely fix that. I mean, the rule of thumb is that if it's less than, less than anti-gravity, there's going to be a residual deficit, chances are. So all the more reason to, um, to have done everything you can uh, to at least um, intervene early for, for some of it is defensive medicine, but also for fear that, you know, the patient will be left questioning, gee, what if we had done this earlier? You know, look at me now, I've, I've got residual foot drop, I can't run. Uh, what, what, if, what if the surgeon had moved on this a little quicker? So I tend to do it early. Yeah, John, I, I, this one, uh, you know, this one, this one really gets me every, every time because I, I, I feel like there is, just like you alluded to, there is the academic textbook answer, then there's the practical answer. I think the prac, you know, like, like you just said, we're not talking about product quina. Everybody knows the answer to that, but, or, or, or almost everybody. But here, you know, I've been in, diff, you know, from my training years to my kind of early career, now mid-career, I think from a practical perspective, we're tending to intervene early. But I, but I do remember back in the day where I had some attendants who used to say, no, a foot drop, without saddle anesthesia, without cauda symptoms is not necessarily a, a, a surgery or an emergency surgery. So um, it's just one of these things that, that shows you how the pendulum swings sometimes. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'll be honest with you. If, if, I, if somebody asked me this question, I, I think I probably put false because I don't think the standard, I don't, I don't think the academic standard of care is as urgent as me. Practically speaking, that's what we do. And maybe that's good enough, but I'm interested in seeing what, what others think about that. Uh, I mean, I probably would do the surgery, but that doesn't mean that it's the standard of care, if you will, because then it implies that everybody has to do it. And I don't know if that's true. There are people who genuinely believe if it's not caught at Aquina, patients will get better. So I'll throw this one out there and everybody else. How, how, urg how urgently are you guys uh, doing it? What, how urgently are you taking these? If I, I mean, today, if I have a patient that comes in with a large disc herniation and a foot drop, say, you know, three, you know, two, three, you know, basically anti less than anti-gravity, lower than anti-gravity, larger herniated disc, I'm probably doing it in the next day or so. I'm probably admitting the patient, probably not sending them back. But I have partners and have had attendings who put the patient on medrol dose pack, sent out physical therapy. Hey, if you're not better, we'll, we'll reconsider. I don't know. What do you think, Matt? What do you what would you do, and how are you trained, and what do you currently do? Well, I, I like the idea of early. I don't, uh, but I guess in my head it's within kind of you know probably within a week. I guess is what what I typically would do. I mean, I, um, yeah, I feel like they, you know it's not that often that I get them that early where it just happened. You know, typically they've already been out and about somewhere by the time they come in, but. Um, yeah, I mean that, but uh, again, yeah, I mean, I, and I would counsel them a lot on on not on if they're less than uh, anti gravity, not you know, not getting fully better. I think the data are pretty convincing about that for most people. So, uh, but I'm curious to hear what everyone else takes on. I, I learned some lessons with the um, incoming novel anticoagulant therapies like uh, rivaroxaban and and things that make um, an urgent decompression impossible. 
um, uh, with, um, I don't know how they are named in the US, uh, uh, Rivaroxaban is, I think, is the most common in orthopedic surgery here. Uh, they, they receive it and it makes an urgent decompression within 24 hours, sometimes impossible. And uh, then um, sometimes it's really amazing how quick um, uh, functional paresis um, more than M M or less than M3 uh, recovers within 24 hours. And some of our urgent indication became very relative. And these novel anticoagulants are widespread here um, in our old um, uh, patient population. And often we have to wait um, 48 hours and sometimes they resolve these neurological deficits. I think a lot of that also is driven by the conversation between uh, the, the surgeon and the patient. I mean, I think if you have a patient uh, who's in the emergency room who says, uh, you know, who, who's dis distressed by the symptoms and who clearly wants you to, uh, to proceed, I'm more likely to proceed than somebody who is very surgery averse, who has maybe a four out of five and really doesn't want to go to surgery. Then I, I might, you know, counsel them and say, look, you know, you've got a deficit, but let's watch it closely and see what happens. Um, I think there's a little bit of leeway on, on that as well. So I'll show you an example of a patient that I did. Uh, actually, I came back. Uh, I was about to leave on vacation. 41-year-old female, very active, two-week history of severe back and leg pain. Not a foot drop, but rather calf weakness, uh, numbness, weakness, could not do a toe raise, has this disc herniation. And um, she, I, we, had, we had accepted a referral to see her in the office. She came to the emergency room on a Saturday. I had just signed out and I was going to be leaving town the next day, uh, but I, I, I came back in and did it. And um, there's, there's no Cotequinus syndrome. This was actually a, a left S1 uh, weakness, a numbness and burning pain. Took this out, big piece of disc, uh, looked really good post-op. The reason we have a post-op scan is because the symptoms didn't really improve post-op. And, uh, Oh, this is another. So uh, persistent symptoms uh, now several months out from surgery, a very significant burning uh, on gabapentin, uh, but a sense that everything that could possibly have been done was done. This patient is in the emergency room on a weekend day. And, um, and I think uh, at least there's a peace of mind of, uh, well, we, we, we jumped, we were all over it. Uh, so sometimes I think symptoms can persist and it's, it's, it's to our advantage to, I think to have been um, kind of uh, aggressive with it. It, it. The more severe the symptoms, the more aggressive I am, I, I guess is how I would characterize it. Uh, this is another example, just for fun, since this is a surgical crowd, uh, another, another emergency dispatient I saw in the office um, and admitted for, for extremely severe symptoms, uh, unable to lie down in bed. Uh, had to sleep bolt upright, was very distressed uh, by, um, by severe radiculopathy symptoms caused in this case by, by what turned out to be, uh, to be a schwannoma. And, um, and, and also somebody, you know, schwannoma normally you kind of do electively, um, but this was a schwannoma that I admitted, which is not very common. And there were by uh, the way, it's a little bit, I think maybe a little bit of hemorrhagic component uh, to this. So. John, John, since you mentioned the, uh, uh, since you're sh showing the schwannoma, I want to ask you about that. You do a fair amount of uh, intradural work. Um, this question comes up occasionally uh, in terms of acuity of symptoms related to these intradural tumors, right? So patients have had back pain, leg pain, leg weakness. When is, you know, short of a hemorrhagic lesion, if you will, when in your mind is an uh, intradural schwannoma or meningioma resection deemed relatively urgent. It's you know, rare. In my books, it's almost never because it's just a slow progressive process. But I always worry if somebody comes in and says, oh my God, I have excruciating leg pain, it's new. And then they've had a schwannoma there forever. What, what are your thoughts on that and your experience? Uh, so the, the, um, the past three, I've had about one a year, the past three years, uh, where somebody has acutely decompensated um, with a known schwannoma. And in each case, um, the thing filled the canal. And these are patients who had been watching the sh schwannoma, uh, who had a very large schwannoma. And I think it gets to the point where the nerves simply can't move out of the way. I have one that where we repeated the scan and it had actually moved down almost one full vertebral level. So I think it got trapped in there. Uh, and I think the nerve roots were on stretch. So I have a before, I should have shown this because it's pretty cool. 
I have a scan a few months earlier, and I have one when the patient is an extremist with severe bilateral radiculopathy, where the thing had actually shifted on her. And once in a while, they do seem to have a little bit of a hemorrhagic component, even though they're not, it's not a frank hemorrhage. And I think that they can acutely get a little bit uh, worse and more swollen. But these are rarely urgent. Uh, and I've had three in three years, but, but that's uncommon. So this was, I think, a very interesting question. People were pretty split on this. You know, you had 50% saying um, yes, if needed. When would you opt perform an elective surgery on someone who was still on 81 milligrams of aspirin, a baby aspirin? I counted myself in the always group because I don't think it has a huge impact. Uh, it's very different than, than the other um, blood thinners. I think if somebody had forgotten to discontinue their eloquence until the day before, it probably uh, you know, wouldn't be doing anything elective on them. But I thought a baby aspirin um, for, for a relatively um, bloodless surgery, especially in ACDF, uh, where, where you can really control the bleeding well, um, to me didn't, it was just kind of a judgment call, but I, I, I would do it. Yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm with you in that camp too. And I, and I think honestly, uh, the anesthesiologist more than any group uh, is the one that uh, kind of changed my practice in this because they, they basically said, hey, if a patient has a cardiac stent and they need to be on baby aspirin, we, we really prefer you not to stop the aspirin. And, and, mm -hmm. and my partner started doing it and I started doing it. I'm like, wow, you can, you can do an ACDF or a posterior cervical on baby aspirin something that we didn't do uh, in training. What really, what really caught my attention here is that 20%. So, you know, one in five folks said that we would not, we would never operate on somebody, you know, on aspirin. So, you know, the question then becomes, let's say somebody's really dependent on it for, you know, history of stroke or, or a card or re recent cardiac stent, you know, um, would, you know, are there people that really will not operate if a patient's on a baby aspirin? Um, I don't know, Nader or, 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 or Alex, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, it sounds like it's pretty, pretty stringent to, to say, we'll, you know, we won't do a cervical spine operation on baby aspirin, but maybe they've had bad experience or maybe that's their training. Uh, I know I've, I've changed, but, that, but I started out that way, honestly. What do you think? Uh, you know, I, I don't like antiplatelets, <laughs> to be honest. I just don't, you know, C2 to T2 and the big wide laminectomy. Yeah, see how I knew you were it, in it that bleeds, It bleeds, it bleeds a little bit. So if it's selective and, I mean, it's a discussion, you know. I mean, I have an upcoming case uh, who who the patient is uh, on aspirin and Plavix and he can't do without them. I mean, if you, you can't like keep the aspirin, do the case with on the aspirin. Uh, because his stents would clot and he needs dual antiplatelet therapy. And what we will do, we'll admit that patient and uh, stop the, uh, like, stop the plavix a week and then, uh, before and then keep the aspirin, then transition him to, to an IV antiplatelet medication with a short half-life. I can't remember its name. Let me just look it up. And then we'll stop that IV antiplatelet medication. Uh, half-life is very short, so you can stop it like the morning of surgery do the operation, then we'll start the uh, baby aspirin the next day. Uh, so that's an extreme case, obviously, because the patient really needs the operation and he's a very high cardiac risk. Now, um, you know, but to me, I mean, if unless it's really super necessary, uh, I, I would want to stop it, to be honest. I mean, I just, I don't want to take a patient back. I mean, the risks are low, but they're not zero to take a back, pay, take, take back a patient uh, uh, for a hematoma. Uh, so, Nader, what are your thoughts on this? The and, and again, I'm just being devil's advocate here. Obviously, yeah. that's what, this is the, the point is to promote and provoke provoke discussion and whatnot. But you know, our, our colleagues do cranial, you know, neurosurgeons and and and, and vascular neurosurgeons do uh, carotids on oh aspirin and yeah, 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 yeah uh, I know, I know. It's I mean, I don't know how they I would do never it, but do they, that. they do. do yeah, yeah, I. As I mentioned, you know, I think you can get away with it with baby aspirin, but anything more than that, I would be very, very um, uh, reluctant, like special aplavix, uh, you know, like a never answer is, is, you know, it's like never say never, right? Like you always want to tailor the treatments or always, right? Like always or never, right? Like you always want to kind of 
look at risks and benefits and then and then make a decision right like th that's that's my take on it um so certainly one can do it on a baby aspirin plavix not really um as you mentioned, they do stents and uh, cranial surgeries. They put even VP shunts on patients with asthma plavix. God bless them. I, I just, uh, <laughs> as much as I can, I don't want to take a patient back. Right. Alex, what's, uh, thank you for that, Nader. Alex, what's, uh, give us some insight from, from your, from your uh, area and your region. What, what does everybody do? In Europe, yeah, we it's changed. It changed ten years ago um, from uh, stop every um, aspirin to now. I do um, elective ACDF surgery. Um, I do elective posterior under ASA. Um, and imagine from the pharmacology um, view, if somebody takes one hundred fifty milligrams of diclofenac or ibuprofen. These, uh, these agents have also a bad influence on, uh, on the thrombocytes. And we, uh, some, some of my patients uh, are um, not telling me what kind of uh, painkillers they take. And these patients are in a much higher danger of bleeding complications than on baby ASA. Yeah, interesting. interesting. John, John, what do you and your partners do? Uh, I think it, on the spine side, we tend to do it, is my impression. On the cranial side, uh, they don't. Uh, for example, I, I posed the same question to, uh, uh, to the residents on the brain tumor service and said, absolutely, under no circumstance. I mean, they'll cancel the case if an aspirin was taken, you know, within 24 hours of the surgery. So, so I think it depends. It's still surgeon dependent. I think it depends on the pathology. If you have a hemorrhagic tumor, if you have... Uh, you know, if you have a, you know, renal cell cancer, or if you have a hemangioblastoma or something that, you know, worries you, uh, you're more likely to say, look, absolutely not. And um, I think if you're doing something that you've done a million times, you know, you're one level ECDF, you're very comfortable with it. Um, I think you, you get to know your own surgery and you, you might say, well, I, I know I can control this. And I think it depends on the risk. Uh, the most risky one I ever did, I had a, uh, on call with subdural hematoma in a patient who, uh, had two mechanical heart valves, and the cardiologist said, off anticoagulation, this person, this person has a 2% per day risk of a major stroke. And so said to me, you know, we've got to resume this within 12 hours of your, of your subdural hematoma evacuation. Like, wow, you know, pretty scary stuff. So I think there's a, a lot of the commenters on your poll talked about the discussion with cardiology and how really, had, if anything, if, if ever there's going to be a joint decision, it has to be between cardiology, the patient, and you. Um, on something like this because it, it affects everyone. So there was an interesting question about robots in spine and uh, robotics. And, and this, is, uh, this is, I think, I, I really like this because I think it'll be interesting to re revisit this question in a year or two or three. It's rapidly evolving uh, as we know. And uh, I was the one who thought it was just a fad uh, that I wanted uh, in its current form with a caveat uh, in its current form. Uh, that is to say, I, I feel as if navigation is a game changer, but I'm not sure that navigation plus uh, insertion of a screw with a robot is as much of a game changer uh, as navigation uh, was. Um, and then the other thing that I started uh, questioning in discussions with John Shin and others is really, is there a fork in the road between robotics on one hand and augmented reality on the other? Now, they're two different things, but uh, each can provide a, a great deal of um, you know, of, of help in the operating room and augmented reality can project um, a representation of the spine superimposed on your existing visual field on, on, on what you're seeing. And so you could insert hardware and um, perform uh, moves knowing what lies uh, beneath. And I, I, I'd really be interested to see what happens with this as we go forward. Yeah, this, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there is, there is tremendous, there's a, there's a lot of bias here, right? There's a lot of bias with the responses, with the respondents, uh, you know, like we talked about be, before, before we got online, uh, John, is, is, you know, who really knows who's answering this? We think it's our colleagues and partners, but, yes. you know, it could be a rep, it could be, you know, a medical student, who knows, but uh, I, I, I still think there is some, some utility behind this just to kind of you know, understand what's, what, what do people think? And, you know, um, you know, robotics is, it's, it's a, it's a, 
it's, it's a big topic. It's, it's a big topic. Enabling technologies in general is, is, a, is a topic and, and, a, and a technology that's here to stay. But, but I, I think you're absolutely right. The key with this, and, and, and we have a few students uh, with us here who are studying this now in a, uh, in a bigger, bigger consensus group, it's not so much where we are now, but it's the trend. It's where we're going to be in three years and five years and 10 years. Um, but I, I, what, are, what are some, I know there's a very, very big topics, but Michael Gano or Nader, uh, I still see you guys there. Uh, Jonathan Rasuli, you're welcome to jump in here, uh, either in the chat box or in person. But what do you, what do you guys think? Mike, Mike Galgano, I'll, I'll pick on you. You're in upstate. You do a lot of, you know, big surgeries, revision surgeries. Do you have a, what's your take on, on, on enabling technologies in your program and your practice? Well, we just got an alarm about uh, about a year or so ago, and uh, I, I was trained with freehand technique and not having tools like robotics and navigation and things of that sort. I think it's fantastic technology, but I think it really has to be balanced with, um, you know, with training our, our next generation of neurosurgeons. Um, you know, I, I did a tumor case today, and we were trying to do percutaneous fixation, and navigation broke down. Uh, we ended up having to do a, a mini open Long story short, you have to have had a freehand thing. So I, I do worry that if, if everyone is trained at robotics and navigation, we're going to lose the ability to, to learn how to do traditional open surgery. So I think it's a fine balance. Yeah, Mike, I 100% I, I agree with you. Um, I, I was mostly trained in freehand technique during my fellowship and uh, during residency as well, too. And really, I mean, just from a time perspective and ease of, um, of placement. I don't think anything's really going to supplant that. I think really where the, where the real main uh, shining points of robotics um, or augmented reality comes um, in, in, in two different ways. One um, is if you are a surgeon who primarily operates with, um, with, uh, with PAs or mid-levels, um, sometimes if you're trying to, this can potentially open up the uh, doors to doing bigger um, deformity cases um, otherwise, you know, if you're doing a T10 of pelvis and, you know, you're putting in all your side screws freehand, then you have an entire other side to put those in. The robot can, can help you or rather help increase your confidence um, and allow you to, you know, let the PA uh, put in screws on their side. So it, it can, it has its use in that setting. The other use is um, if you're trying to do um, something like a single position lateral um, or, uh, or single position OLIF. You know, if you want to put in the screws on the control uh, at the same time as you're putting in the interbody, um, the robot opens up some degree of confidence. You know, kind of locks you into that position because it can be very hard to put in the um, the screws uh, that are, I guess, proximal to the bed, and um, the robot can really kind of fix you in a good position to do that. But then again, at the same time, people argue that um, you know how accurate is it when you are you know hammering in that interbody in a lateral position? Is it really so accurate, or does it maintain its accuracy? You know, we still have some ways to go um, with data from that, but I, I would think those are the two real uh, standing out points for robotics. But when, if it comes to a simple, you know, L45 T lift, I, I don't really see any use of robotic there. I think it just adds time. It's really more of a, a nuisance than anything else. It's a rapidly evolving field, so I'm sure uh, we'll look back and uh, our transfers may differ over time. It's a really cool question. Um, let's see. Oh, racing. So um, it seems that this is also uh, something that's changed over the years. Uh, since certainly since I was a resident, uh, I, I I don't brace anymore. Uh, I think internal fixation probably is is much stronger than any bracing could add. So the question is, do we brace for other reasons? Do we brace for you know? Do we brace to remind somebody to avoid to over uh, overdoing it? Do we brace for comfort? Uh, so in this meta-analysis uh, published in March uh, out of, I think, Hartford, uh, Connecticut, uh, it didn't seem like braces did much in this meta-analysis. And I, I think, um, you know, I, I've, I personally have fallen away. I, first, I have to say a lot of patients don't, we're not very compliant with bracing. Uh, we're not very uh, happy with braces. And I think it, it just makes it, uh, makes it easier to practice uh, for that one. But I'd be interested. Hear what other people say. This this was for one or two level. This was not for for trauma. Or, right. Or yeah, yeah, that's right, John. I mean, that's you know, I, I think in the in the you know major deformities of scolies, I think a lot of people are still not using braces. But really, what we want, I mean, I 
my point was to make it even simpler and more straightforward. Okay, for, the, for that one level, two level lumbar fusions, who's doing it? And, and, and as you see here, again, take, take this with a grain of salt, but, but you know, almost 40%, 36, you know, 36% of people said they would, depending on whether it's always or smokers or osteoporosis. Uh, I forget which, which colleague it was, but there's someone who made a really nice comment and said that, you know, in this day and age of, of which we're trying to be, you know, more conscious about, about cost and, and, you know, cost-effective treatments, this is not a cost-effective treatment and it's really not effective, period. So I think your point is well taken, you know, who are we treating? Um, I will say this though, um, probably more for the necks than the backs. Surprisingly, I have a lot of patients who in a way ask for it or are surprised when I say you don't need a brace because I think it's a cultural thing. They grew up with it, their mom or grandfather or, or neighbor had it and they associate brace, whether it's a neck brace or a back brace with having surgery. So it puts, uh, there are a few instances in which I, they almost felt like I was under, you know, under delivering care or substandard care because I didn't give them a brace. And that bothered me a little bit. Uh, I don't know, Mike Selby, here you are. I see you. You're, uh, I hope you're, I don't know if you're a driver or you're a passenger, but thanks <laughs> for joining us. No, I, I've stopped. I've pulled over. But uh, the, um, look, for me, I, I'm completely with you. Uh, stable internal fixation should never need a brace. But you know, your point on, on the uh, patient expectation, and I think a little bit of patient comfort, I brace my posterior cervicals now. So any long posterior cervical I brace because I think they get a degree of muscular dysfunction and I don't make them wear the brace all the time, but I give them a brace and say, if you're more comfortable wearing this for the first few weeks, you wear it as your incision heals and your muscles heal up. Because I do find that C2 to T2, they tend to get a bit of this drop head kind of posture and uh, it's all muscle related. And uh, I think that in that particular circumstance, bracing uh, can be useful, but 95% uh, nah, um, no need. Completely agree with you on posterior cervical. Those are painful operations. And a lot of times the patient will say, look, I just need a little, you know, I need a little support here. And I think yeah. that's maybe different than the one or two level lumbar, lumbar spine. We always have to remember the compliance of patients. We can prescribe every brace, whether they take it or not. It's a completely different question. And my former head uh, boss in, uh, in, in Hanover had a nice photo gallery of braces and where they go to um, <laughs> first perfect place. And then later they uh, wander around everywhere where they should not be. Um, it's a very, very funny gallery. That's cool. In the interest of time, uh, maybe we have time for, for one more, and then I'll just would like to show a slide with some uh, thought-provoking things. So uh, difficult surgical approaches. I think this is something that I would have done with the fusion early in my practice. The question was, could you do this just uh, without a fusion? Could you do this um, just posteriorly, laminectomy, and get in there uh, without having to take down the pedicle or the head of the rib or the transverse process? And I think uh, early on uh, when doing these, I would not have had the confidence to do this through laminectomy, but I think if you, if you gain a little bit of, uh, of experience with these, uh, you, you, you become a little bit more confident in your ability to work through a narrow corridor, uh, through that small corridor between pedicle and cord. It's, it's very narrow, but we get away with it, I think, because these tumors uh, do detach easily from, from the cord. There's usually an arachnoid plane, and that allows you to remove what's in your corridor and then deliver a little bit more tumor, remove what in the corridor and, and keep going like that. So um, I think this can be done uh, without a fusion, but I, I wouldn't have thought that years ago. And um, I just wanted to maybe show you, um, there's so much stuff, uh, like we could go on for hours with fusion and synovial cyst, to fuse or not to fuse. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, to point out that th there are so many things that now uh, have some data that we still use, see using our practice, right? Steroid injection for stenosis. Uh, there's a good, good New England Journal article that tells us that it doesn't work for stenosis. Yet uh, in this practice, we certainly see countless patients referred to us for stenosis, not disc herniation. I think disc herniation is a different entity, a lot of inflammation in an acute disc. They enhance with gadolinium administration, they're very inflammatory. But chronic stenosis, claudication, uh, we still see this. Um, chiropractic care, what, what's its role? When should we use it? 
I, I have developed uh, some uh, referral patterns with chiropractors who send me patients with, uh, with, with nerve compression syndromes. And I think we do a very good job keeping some patients out of the operating room. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, what are our feelings on that? Uh, gabapentin. Uh, similarly, there's another uh, article. Uh, granted, this is, not, this is the, the pre-drug. But it, it tells us that for acute and chronic sciatica, uh, it doesn't work any better than placebo. And yet, I can't tell you uh, the percentage of patients uh, in, in this practice who are referred on gabapentin. And, and these are people who are driving on gabapentin, who are sometimes a little foggy. Um, uh, I, I, there's not a whole lot of data to support using gabapentin. Um, I suppose it, it can work, but on average, it probably doesn't really work. It makes people foggy. And, and I would say more than 50% of patients referred to me for sciatica or nerve compression syndrome on gabapentin. So I thought this might be another uh, thing. Um, management of spondylolysis without spondylolisthesis. What do we do when we come across a pars fracture that's chronic um, like this? You know, do we fuse this person? Do, do we, are, are we sure their back pain will get better uh, if, we, if we do a 5-1 fusion in someone with a, a a healed parts fracture and back and mechanical back pain. Uh, I, I have some certainly there's some variability in this in this region on, on how this is managed. And then the one other thought I had that would be an interesting and provocative idea is when do we do uh, when do we still do a lumbar foraminotomy versus um, some type of interbody device for foraminal stenosis. Uh, this is an intraoperative image of a patient with a very uh, who strongly wanted to avoid a fusion, but whose spedicles were pretty close together. And on the right side of the image, the, the gap around the nerve root, that, that's a hole in the pedicle. Uh, on the right side of the screen, that space, uh, I took down a little bit of the pedicle to free up this nerve. This was really hard. This, this was harder to do than a fusion. I thought a uh, patient did well, but, but I wasn't sure I was doing the right thing by removing a little bit of her pedicle to create more space for her nerve root in someone who had um, already told me she was not going to accept a fusion. So when, when is it still acceptable to just do a lumbar foraminotomy and, and what kind of success rate do we have with that? So um, I, I just, well, um, I guess I'll, I'll conclude just by saying that, you know, that I, I can't believe how many questions remain unanswered uh, and how you've managed to cover so much practice variability uh, with your social media polls. And I, I think it just highlights there's so many opportunities for studies. Uh, this, if anything, generates ideas uh, on, on what we can study, what we can explore. Uh, so, so I want to thank you for that. Yeah, of course, of course. And, and thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for, for joining us today and, and for really kind of uh, bringing to life some of these things that we put on, on social media. But, but I really do feel that you're right. It, uh, it, it basically makes us better aware of what others do. It does uh, provoke some questions, some research questions, some, uh, you know, practical academic questions. Uh, and it's always interesting to see what others do. Uh, I certainly do that because I learn a lot. Um, and, and this was great, a great way of kind of bringing it to life. So I appreciate that. And thank you for being a fan of, of those polls. But you're absolutely right. Great questions uh, ahead. Um, I think that's both what's, uh, what's unique about our field is there's so much science to it, but there's so much art to it. Um, a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, we, we should have less variability, and, and I don't disagree with that, but I got to admit, I, I like a little bit of variability. I, I like to kind of retain that artistic, stylistic approach to it. Um, so good, good questions, and we'll see where we are in 10, 15 years. So uh, thank you very much for that uh, and for joining us today. It's, it's, it's an honor to have you join us. Um, I think we are a few minutes uh, uh, past time, so I, I wanted to thank the, our participants today and the excellent engagement by our uh, co-hosts and panelists, uh, Drs. Mamagani, uh, uh, Nader, Rasuli, Dr. Selby, Galgano, Dr. Goodwin, who had to leave earlier, Dr. Wendy Gibbs, who's with us, so, uh, and John Shin, who was here earlier as well. So thank you, everyone. Sorry we're a little bit uh, uh, late, but it was a great session. Uh, we will see everyone again next Thursday. Dr. John Chin is hosting next week, and uh, uh, pretty soon we will know what, what the topic is. So stay tuned and continue to follow us. And uh, John, thank you so much. And uh, have a great so night, much. everyone. Good night. Take care.